place. And how much time do we have? As long as you need. Well, the beginning was March 28 of 1836, which means that tomorrow would be the 181st anniversary of the date that the treaty was signed by the Ottawa and Chippewa Bands of Michigan with the United States in Washington, D.C. And in that treaty, the Ottawa and Chippewa ceded about, or conveyed ownership, of about 40 million acres of land of what is now the state of Michigan and most of the lower peninsula north of the Grand River where Grand Rapids is located and it flows into Lake Michigan and Grand Haven. The northern portion of the lower peninsula uh, and the eastern portion of the upper peninsula was conveyed, title to the land was conveyed by the uh, Indians that occupied that territory. Under Anglo-Saxon law, under the law that the United States recognized, title could have been acquired by the United States from the Indians one of two ways. Either through a contract, through a treaty, by which the Indians agreed to convey title, or through conquest. Uh, but in those days, the Ottawa and Chippewa bands were still aligned with the United States. The United States was concerned because there were continuing conflicts with the British. Think about the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. And there was no fighting between the United States and the Indians that occupied this territory. But as the original occupants, as the persons who occupied this territory before the European invasion, if you will, uh, the Ottawa and Chippewa were considered to have legal title. The United States needed legal title so that the state of Michigan could achieve statehood. And in fact, statehood for the state of Michigan was in January of 1837. So in March of 1836, the United States bargained with the Indians to acquire legal title so that Michigan could become a state. But the Indians did not want to give up the uses they were making of the land. Uses being hunting and fishing and gathering. And so the Indians, in part of this bargain, reserved the right to hunt, reserved the right to fish, reserved the right to gather plants and other materials, throughout the session area, throughout the area in which they agreed to give up title. And that was 1836, and it wasn't until 1979 that the federal court ruled that when the Indians had uh, ceded the territory to the United States, Nonetheless, they had reserved these rights. The word that's often used is usufruct, U-S-U-F-R-U-C-T. The usufructuary rights are the uses that were being made of those lands at the time of the treaty. And the reason that it took so long before the treaty rights for the Michigan, Ottawa, and Chippewa tribes were upheld is because there was a very sad history of the United States that anybody watching this is probably really familiar with. And in Michigan, part of that sad history was that in 1872, the then Secretary of the Interior determined unilaterally without legal authority, he determined that it was no longer necessary to provide services to the Michigan tribes that had agreed to convey this territory in the treaty. Now part of their rights as a treaty tribe was to continue having services from the federal government, services for health and education and welfare and, and um, in the basic types of services that were being provided to tribes throughout the country. But the Michigan tribes were unilaterally cut off as of 1872. And for the Grand Traverse Band, it wasn't until 108 years later, in 1980, that they were restored to the status that they were entitled to 
as treaty signatories. And so Grand Traverse Band was in, 18, in 1980 when that restoration took place by act of the Interior Department and then in 1994 our sister tribes to the north and south. The, to the north the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians and to the south the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians based in Petoskey, Emmett County area to the north, based in Manistee, Mason counties to the south. Those tribes achieved the same status by Act of Congress in 1994. But the point is, is that for well over a hundred years, these tribes were not considered by the United States as having a political relationship. That didn't get re re reinstated or restored until, as I said, the 1980s, 1990s. And it wasn't until after that restoration took place that these tribes could then assert the rights that they had reserved under the treaty. So in some respects, even though we are 181 years from the signing of the treaty, what's happening now is still pretty early in terms of the evolution of what an Indian tribe has with respect to treaty rights and what that might mean. And the reason I ask, the, or I, I phrase it in the sense of what it might mean is because it gets, to, it gets us to the issues that are at hand right now in this state. One of those issues being the Line 5 pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac, another issue being Nestle's current pending application to withdraw a ma vast amounts of water from the groundwater within the, the treaty area, within the session area of the 1836 treaty, and if they pump that much groundwater, it's going to have an adverse impact upon surface waters. And the surface waters, if they diminish when that pumping takes place, will have an adverse impact upon the resources that the tribes reserved in the treaty. It will have an impact on streams, on wetlands, that in turn will have an impact on the critters, the fish, the plants. And so uh, some of these issues, you would, one would think, well, you've been around a long time. The treaty is a long, long time ago. And yet, as I've explained, there has been a really recent history in terms of establishing those treaty rights. And then once you're established, there has to be a period of time for the tribal governments to grow for the Natural Resources Department here at Grand Traverse Bend to develop, to have staffing, to be able to dig into these issues that ultimately get to the question of protection of the reserved resources. And the one thing that the Indian tribes bring to the table with respect to issues like the pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac or the uh, groundwater pumping is the courts have recognized both in old U.S. Supreme Court decisions but also in a decision by the federal court on behalf of Grand Traverse Band in 1995 that was upheld on, on, appeal, on appeal in 1998, the courts have recognized that the treaty reserved resources, the fish in the Great Lakes, the animals, the plants, that the Indian tribes have a property right in these resources that's reserved by treaty. And that's the bizarre thing that sort of the connection or, or, or relationship between the tribe's treaty rights and these natural resources is that I'm sure that from an Indian's perspective, and I don't pretend to be able to speak from the perspective of the members of the tribe, or the connection, spiritual connection that many individual Indian people would have. But my assumption is, is that that connection that they feel probably isn't framed in terms of a property right. And yet, as a lawyer, I know that one of the screwiest things in this country under our legal system is that you and I, as residents or as citizens, feel very strongly, perhaps, about an environmental issue. And we feel that we ought to be able to challenge an action if it's going to have a harmful impact on the environment. But the courts 
in this conservative era that we're in, both with the U.S. Supreme Court and with our own Supreme Court here in the state of Michigan, the courts have restricted the ability of citizens to challenge environmental matters. And the courts require us to show a specific standing that somehow that we're going to suffer a peculiar or particular harm. Right. Well, with an Indian tribe, if our Anglo American legal system says that they have a property right in the resources, it actually means that the tribes have a stronger case to make than I can make as a citizen in terms of challenging, for example, whether a pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac poses an unacceptable risk to the fishery resource, or whether groundwater pumping may adversely impact the plants, the fish, the critters that rely on water resources. And, and that will be really interesting over time to see how it plays out and to see whether Indian tribes will be able to continue funding environmental programs. I mean, we're recording this before Congress has decided what's going to happen for the fiscal budget, this fiscal year, for the remaining budget, for the remaining portion of the last six months of fiscal year 17. We now have you know, budget issues that will come up on fiscal years 18 and 19. We have a president who's hell-bent on, on cutting budgets, you know, if you're a rich person you might do better off because your taxes will be lower, but the rest of us, it's, you know, there's some serious questions as to what's going to happen. If there are drastic cutbacks in Indian country, it may be difficult for the tribal natural resources departments to continue monitoring, but uh, the, over time the question is going to be whether the tribes can monitor these environmental issues and be able to be in a position to challenge actions that might have an adverse impact on these treaty reserved resources. Because as I said, given the fact that the tribes have property rights in these resources, the tribes are in a better position in some respects to challenge these potential problems than uh, the rest of us as citizens could be. Right, so if you don't mind, if we wind the clock back, so you've got the treaty you said in 1836. 1836. 1836. And that is where the, they were guaranteed their hunting, gathering, and fishing rights. That's where they were reserved. It's often misspoken because especially when there was a great deal of vitriol, a great deal of discrimination against Indian people, after the federal court declared the Great Lakes fishing rights in 1979, it was often mischaracterized as, you, we gave these to you, you were granted these, but that was then, now is now, you don't, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't honor it now because that was way back then. Well, that's not what took place. What took place is the Indians reserved, they gave up the ownership, but they reserved the rights. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. So, Let's fast forward to 1953 when Enbridge decide they're putting in this oil pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac. Technically, if those rights had been reserved, then shouldn't there have been a consultation process with the people that had a <laughs> that had a dog in a dog in the game, if you like? Well, yes, except that the people that had a a stake in it, the people that had a right, were wiped off the face of the earth, if you will, by federal policy, because we had this federal policy uh, enacted illegally by the Secretary of the Interior in 1872. He declared it wasn't necessary to provide services any longer to the Indian tribes. The federal government went through a series of, of federal policies with respect to Indian people, and I'm not the historian, historian who's really able to give you chapter and verse during the various eras, but we had policies in the late 1800s and early 1900s in which uh, it was deemed by the dominant society to be in the Indian's best interest to become part of the white, part of the dominant society. They were better off, it was deemed, to no longer retain a tribal 
uh, identity, to instead terminate the tribal existence, to assimilate the Indian people into the dominant cult culture. And so around here, you did not have the continuation of services to the Indian tribes, but what you did have is Indian kids being taken out of their homes and put into boarding schools and having the, literally the Indian beat out of them at the boarding schools by uh, not being able to continue any cultural uh, existence by being uh, beaten if they were speaking in their um, native languages, uh, by being adopted away from their Indian families and adopted out into non-Indian families. And we had a series of policies that included termination of Indian tribes, included assimilation of Indian people into the dominant culture, and you have to get into the late 1960s and early 1970s before the federal policy comes back to one of self-determination for Indian people. And so, yes, in 1953, yes, they had a treaty right, the Indian signatories of the treaty had a right to fish in the Straits of Mackinac where this pipeline was going through. But none of the Indian tribes in the vicinity of the Straits of Mackinac were then federally acknowledged whether it's the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians basically to the north, whether it's the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians whose homelands, whose reservation include Emmett County, which is where the pipeline comes in to the lower peninsula uh, from the Straits of Mackinac, or whether it's the Grand Traverse Band down here, whether it's the Little River Band down in Manistee, all of these tribes have rights under the 1836 treaty and none of those tribes were acknowledged by the federal government in 1953. So they weren't acknowledged in 1953. You move forward, you said, into 1980 when they finally, the Grand Traverse Band was recognized. Uh, and then 1995, I believe you said that the um, Little little Bay Bands. The 1994, the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians and the uh, Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, 1994. So now they have been federally recognized. My logic would say that they would then have to be consulted retrospectively about anything that's happening there. Well, <laughs> just seems common sense. It, they should have been in the first place. They hadn't been. Now, it now does seem common sense. And there is, oh, lip service consultation that takes place. But the Grand River Span has been very active since three years ago in interacting with the Environmental Protection Agency, with the pipeline FIMSA, Pipeline Safety Hazardous Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. I'm not even gonna get with involved with that one. Well this is the agency of the Department of Transportation that's been uh, delegated by federal law as supposedly dealing with safety issues on pipelines. But it's funded by the very people that, that it put Well that put true the and in. I am not an expert on the pipeline safety laws. I'm not an expert on environmental laws. My understanding is, however, that the federal regulatory scheme tilts toward the operators, toward the pipeline companies, and that it really isn't fair for any of us to assume that we are being protected by the federal laws that now apply to pipelines. And in fact, the pipeline companies themselves, the Coast Guard, the federal agencies, I think they all concede that if we had an oil spill, which is not a strong enough word, but if we had a spill in the Straits of Mackinac, that their ability to clean up is what, maybe a third at max? There is no, there is in fact no emergency. There is no approved federally recognized emergency cleanup plan because in the winter time, how do you clean up below? You, you can't possibly, and the Coast Guard has admitted that during good weather, you can't possibly get it all. And none of that factors into the, the federal laws. The federal law does not have an absolute position that if there is a potential catastrophe that you may not do it. However, if they were to start all over, at least you'd have the ability to require the companies to go through the process under the National Environmental Policy Act. Maybe. And the reason I say maybe is because 
Look at what, what's happened with Dakota Access, where you have thousands of crossings, of water crossings, that normally would require an environmental assessment and or an environmental impact statement, and yet the Army Corps grants a nationwide permit exception to this. And, um, you know, we can argue as to whether the NEPA requirement should apply to the Straits of Mackinac, but your point is, is that the pipeline went in 1953. Well, the National Environmental Protection Act, or excuse me, National Environmental Policy Act did not exist then. I think it was 1970 before it was enacted. And the National Historic Preservation Act did not exist then. Both those laws, in theory, would protect the Indian concerns with respect to the Straits of Mackinac. It is the most historic location for Indian fishing. I mean, that was, was part of the federal court's ruling in 1979. You have the historic connection of the Indians. You have hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish harvested annually from the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, all of those mean that this is extremely important. And that's without getting into the cultural issues that I'm sure you've talked to others about. And I, again, I don't feel comfortable speaking to that, but the cultural, the religious aspects, is, well, maybe spiritual is a better word to uh -huh. use. Um, these are so important that if they were truly being looked at now, we would not allow a pipeline. I mean, we have a, an attorney general in Michigan who's already gone on record to say that it wouldn't be built today. Well, if it wouldn't be built today, then why is it still pumping? Right, absolutely. But your, you know, your point is well taken. There was no consultation then. Part of it is what I explained earlier, which is that uh, it, those treaty rights were not on anybody's radar screen in 1953. And in fact, they're still not today. To switch gears to Nestle, when Nestle applied for its massive water withdrawal permit back in July of last year, they didn't ever take into consideration the existence of these treaty rights. So it's I, I shouldn't use the Roger excuse me, I shouldn't use the Roger Danger Dangerfield, is that his name? Rodney Dangerfield example because most of our viewers and listeners may not be old enough to remember that old comedic line of his about never getting any respect. Well, he didn't deserve respect. The Indian tribes do deserve respect. And yet, even though they have a property right that has been deemed by the federal courts as being paramount to, superior to, in the language of the federal courts here in Michigan, superior to the rights of the state, or the rights of those persons within the state, like me, non-Indians, who might want to go hunt and fish, we have a, we can get a license. We, it's sort of like a driver's license. We have a privilege to be able to do this, but we don't have a right. Well, the Indians have a right, and they have a right that their culture, they have strong cultural, spiritual connections to it, and yet those connections, those rights, really are not being respected. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if we look at the Great Lakes and who, who has responsibility when it comes to uh, being protectors and taking care of, my understanding from what I've learned in this week, the, the week and a bit I've been up here with the Grand Traverse Bay um, Band, is that they have a 50-50 right in protecting those waters with the state. Well... I'd say that the right is not marginalized that way. The tribes have an absolute right because they have a property right in those resources. But with respect to the current allocation of the fishing harvest, there is an allocation order that's in place under the, the uh, federal court. A, 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 it's called a consent decree by which there's a determination as to who would harvest what fish from what areas. But in terms of the ability to protect that right, the tribes have an absolute right that, and this is interesting, thinking again to the Nestle example, because we haven't gotten into the legal issues on Enbridge. On the Nestle example, if you're that corporation, you're going to argue that it's a balancing test that should apply. 
that yes, the tribes have their rights, or yes, these environmental groups are concerned about the, the potential impact on the water, but you really need to balance that against our rights as a corporation to make money and commerce. Well, the problem with that test is that commerce always trumps. Excuse me for the bad pun. <laughs> but it's probably a good time to be saying it, given what's going on in Washington. Uh, and I would argue that the balancing test isn't allowed when you're dealing with a reserved treaty right. That by virtue of the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, Clause 2, and I'll paraphrase, treaties made under the authority of the United States are the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding state laws to the contrary. Well, that means, as I said earlier, because a federal court ruled in, uh, I guess in the late 80s, that there was an earlier consent decree on the Great Lakes, and non-native fishers, state licensed fishers, were put out of business by virtue of this allocation agreement with the tribes. And they filed suit against the state arguing that they had rights to equal protection of the laws and it wasn't fair for Indians to continue fishing and put them out of business. And the federal judge said to them, sorry, your right isn't equal. The state's right isn't equal with the tribes. The tribes have a paramount right by virtue of the Supremacy Clause. And that's the important focus, whether we're dealing with Nestle and groundwater pumping or dealing with Enbridge is that it's necessary for that to be fully comprehended and understood. And the state of Michigan isn't there yet. So then when you look at these meetings, let's say we, the pipe, Pipeline Safety Advisory Board meeting, and you have a board of 16 people, for argument's sake, how many of those people should be tribal representatives? Well, from our perspective, they probably all should be. Based on the fact that the, the treaty supersedes everything. And else. the problem with the way things like that are set up is that it's, there's sort of inevitable that there's going to be some sort of political compromise along the way. And from a tribe's perspective, treaty rights are not to be compromised. You either have the right and you protect the right, or, but you don't enter into some sort of political arrangement by which the corporation gets its bit and the attorney general gets to run for governor claiming that he's protected the resource. Uh, no. Now, uh, to the makeup of the board, you probably already have addressed this. I believe there is one Indian, one there, Native American. There was, yes. And he was there because his tribe was impacted by the spill on the Kalamazoo River. And again, that term is not strong enough, you know, because we're... Spill seems to be, you know, just a you little know, bit so here. Over, you know. And it's going to, you know, we're going to be able to resolve that. Well, that was the largest discharge of oil in the United States, uh, what took place in the Kalamazoo River. And what could happen, what will happen in the Straits of Mackinac from the, from the pipeline that was installed in 1953, what will happen will be a disaster. It will be catastrophe from which the resource won't recover. And yet, if you're Enbridge, Excuse me, folks, but Enbridge could give a shit because from their perspective, it's all cost-benefit analysis. This is the same company, and I don't, I, I didn't know that you were going to corral me today to talk. I don't have my talking points with me. I didn't go back and look at my files. But That's good because we took from the heart. On this if show. I were to look at my files, I would find a press release that was announced last summer when Enbridge merged with somebody else. And so they're thumping themselves on their chest and talking about how this combined merger 
This merger means that the combined company has a net value, or gross value, excuse me, of, I may be off by a billion or two, but my recollection is it was $164 billion. Now, granted, those are Canadian dollars. So, so maybe we're only talking about $140 billion. But contrast this against what Enbridge has predicted if there were a disaster in the Straits of Mackinac. They've predicted this is going to be $400 million. Well, somebody else on the other side is, oh, no, no, it's going to be seven or $800 million. But compared to $140 billion, this is peanuts. This is a cost of doing business. They could give a shit, mind you, that there is a disaster. If it happens, eh, we'll go through all that and we'll try to make good and we'll make you whole and we'll hire a bunch of people to take their boats out and pretend to be cleaning it up. But, well, do they care that the spawning grounds are going to be destroyed for, for decades? Do they, does it really matter to them? Do they have a heart? Is it going to factor into their consideration the importance of the treaty rights, the cultural, the spiritual concerns, the concerns about how important the water is to the natives? No. None of that matters to them. They will dip into their pocket, they'll come up with 600 million, 800 million, whatever it takes, they'll walk away from it, and they'll just chalk it up to, well, shit happens. But we're going to move on, and we could care. You Native Americans whose lives have been destroyed, we could care. Well, let's not... Let, Facetiously, let, said. Well, yeah, no, I understand. Let's not get it wrong, though. It's not just Native Americans. It's everybody. I mean, we're, we're talking about 20% of the world's fresh surface water. We're talking about 95% of America's, USA's fresh surface water. So it's not just Natives. It's everybody, because everyone needs water. And also, I mean, you're talking about... 800, let's say 800 million it's going to cost Enbridge. But this is a 37 billion dollar economy for the Great Lakes with the tourism. Add into that another 7 billion from commercial and re uh, recreational fishing. So you're looking at 42 billion dollars. Uh, if I did that math right, no I didn't, 44 billion dollars. Um, so surely if something was to happen would be a heck of a lot more that would come down on Enbridge than, than the 800 billion, wouldn't well, it? Well, perhaps, but BP it? has survived the disaster in the Gulf. That's not the point. I think what's interesting is you're pointing out all of the other players, the citizens, the businesses, who are so concerned about this issue. And we're seeing a real political movement in Michigan that has the Native Americans the tribes, I think Indian people refer to themselves as Indians rather than as Native Americans, but uh, the Indian tribes, the Indian people are aligned with all sorts of folks who 20 years ago might have been at odds with each other, 30 years ago. And there is a real spirit of trying to work together to wrestle this monster to the ground. And Russell to the ground is simply to shut down Line 5. There are folks who believe that if you were to require a full-blown environmental impact statement and require risk analysis and require alternatives analysis, that we would find that Enbridge has alternatives that would allow them to get the oil to market and would not require pumping through the Straits of Mackinac. Case closed. Right. And so why are we running, continuing to use a pipeline that is going to be a disaster? And the answer is, it's business. Why should I expend money that I don't have to if I'm the owner of the business? Um, but back to your point, uh, it, 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 I can't imagine what the economy in St. Ignace and Mackinac City and Mackinac Island and all of the shoreline of Lake Huron and Michigan and Superior, well, not Superior, can't flow upstream, but nonetheless, I, it's hard to imagine how many, many people would survive once that disaster happens.
Right, and then there's the health. The, then there's the things we haven't talking about regarding what when oil spills, like in Kalamazoo, the the health effects. People have higher rates of leukemia. Pets are seen with tumors all over their body. Respiratory diseases. So well, you start to factor that into. Well, absolutely, and uh, you know this is one of the most important flyways for migratory birds. None of them will survive because they're all going to stop off in the Great Lakes. You know, and you can go one step to another to another to another and predict how horrible things are going to be. And so the frustration is if we can predict that, why won't people of authority say stop? Right. And it's not just a great, it's, it's not just a USA issue. It's a Canadian issue as well. I just spent a week in, a few days in the unceded Indian territory of Wakwemakon on Manitoulin Island, uh, right there on Lake Huron. And I mean, they have not only Pipeline 5, a little bit up the road from them, they've got Sarnia, which is the uh, refinery for many of the pipelines there. That's the place, first place in the world where a population has been found to have a gender imbalance of birth, meaning for every one boy that's born, two girls are born, instead of the traditional 50-50. You've then got the radioactive um, waste that's being suggested be to be buried over on the other side of Lake Huron. Which will drain into the Great Lakes and threaten the Great Lakes again. So surely isn't that, that would have to be covered by these well, treaty wait a minute, we're speaking on the day and I haven't seen any news today, but isn't this the day that the Environmental Protection Agency, the new head, who's spent his career as a Attorney General in the state of Oklahoma challenging regulations of the Environmental Protection Agency, isn't this the day that he's going to withdraw many of the regulations or the policies that the Obama administration put in place to try to restrict uh, admissions from coal plants and Yes, yeah, so we're, we're looking at environmental issues that are going to get worse at a time that our government is going to make it easier for, uh, for those to pollute the environment and to not deal with climate change. So there's something wrong with this picture. Eh? There's, there's something very, very wrong with this picture indeed. <laughs> so Excuse going me forward. For, for laughing, but if we can't have a sense of gallows humor, what do we do? You have to. So going forward for the people that are watching, because there's a lot of people that are interested in making a difference and doing something, what would you say the biggest thing is that people can, can do to, to force this issue? Because well, it's not rocket science, you can take this to a five-year-old in school and lay out the, lay out the situation and almost every single five-year-old would say, uh-uh, this is, don't do this. Well, in the state of Michigan, and, and I am not politically active within the state other than as a voter, nor are the tribes generally. But we have a gubernatorial election next year. We're on the, the different four-year cycle than the presidential elections in the country. So we will have candidates declaring sometime this year to run for governor of Michigan, Democrat side, Republican side. Uh, we have a pretty good idea that the current attorney general is going to run for governor on the Republican side. I don't care who it is. I don't care who is running for state house, state senate. Uh, I think what we have to do is to become active. What we have to do is to let folks who are going to run for office know how important these issues are and to try to pin them down on taking a position, whether it's with respect to Line 5 or whatever the other environmental issues are. I think they assume that if they're getting funded from business interest that they can just listen to the party line and not have to think about it. And I would hope that all of us can help folks who are considering running for office understand that they really need to be thinking about the environmental issues because here in Michigan or in Ontario, any place nearby the Great Lakes, we depend, our livelihoods depend upon the environment on having clean water. And it isn't just Indian treaty rights, it's the Mon Pa stores that, that live on the tourist industry.
and all of us depend upon a healthy environment and we are at a point in time right now with the recent election in the United States that we're trending the wrong direction and the only way to get a handle on that is to say no listen to us we have to do something and back to your question at least in the state of Michigan the elected officials have the ability to enforce that easement that allowed that pipeline to be put in the Straits of Mackinac in 1953. Legally, they have the authority to say no to Enbridge. They have the authority now under state law, under the Great Lakes Submerged Lands Act, under the terms of the easement, under the Michigan Environmental Protection Act. The legal authority exists to shut down Line 5. We just need to have elected officials with a backbone to do it. The facts are there. You know that from the reporting that you've done. But we still have politicians who are listening to persons other than the citizens of the state of Michigan. They're listening to the economic interest of whatever the industry happens to be. But this doesn't have to be an either-or situation. This doesn't have to be, you know, giving up our, our motor vehicles, although it would be nice if we drove motor vehicles that got 50 miles to a gallon instead of 20, which is another thing that the current federal administration is doing away with. with um, but I think that we have to take it upon ourselves instead of just lamenting, oh my god, it's terrible. That doesn't get us anywhere. We have to put pressure on the folks who have the ability to say no to Ambridge. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I agree with you that it can't go from like driving all driving cars today till tomorrow we don't drive cars. There's, there's got to be that pathway and there's got to be that road to it. But certainly reducing the amount of oil that's being produced and in my opinion stopping exporting this, the exporting of crude oil and oil because it's a finite resource we can all, all agree on that it's more and more costly to bring this oil out of the ground so surely if we wanted to to continue using this oil wouldn't it make more sense to only use american oil well it's absolutely last longer but it also makes sense not to be kicking the can down the road because sooner or later we're going to have to have alternative sources right. that we rely on we're going to have to have vehicles that don't need to use fossil fuels. All of that is already possible. Uh -huh. We had policies in place with the Obama administration that were nudging us toward that. And it's ridiculous to be at the point we are now where we're burying our heads in the sand as if we're an ostrich. But um, we have to deal with it. We can't rely on the governmental officials to do it for us. We have to become active politically. And I'm, I'm not political at all. In fact, I, I'm not a citizen, so I can't vote. So unfortunately, I don't really have much of a say in that side of things. But what I would ask is, just from my standpoint, I would have thought the first person who was running for governor in Michigan that stood up and said, I'm going to be protecting the Great Lakes. I'm going to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. I would have thought from just the people I've spoken to around here, they would have massive, massive support from what really mattered. One would think so. It's hard to find anybody who's going to argue against us if we're talking about these issues. I mean, seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, I, Bill, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll talk some more in the future. I'm happy to be of help. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys.